I'll start with Tesla. He had a very famous quote. He said, if you want to understand the universe, think in terms of energy, vibration, and frequency. Are you Satoshi Nakamoto? You said before, there's no second best to Bitcoin. What would be the second best? So the Bitcoin price has gone through quite a roller coaster. What do you think is the high point it's going to hit? Michael Saylor, preduzetnik i izvršni direktor MicroStrategy, softwareske kompanije vredne više milijardi dolara, koja pruža analitiku podataka i bezbedonosna rešenja. Poznat je po svojoj stručnosti u tehnologiji i poslovnoj strategiji i prepoznat kao lider u razmišljenjima u oblastima velikih podataka, računarstva i blockchaina. Saylor je takođe istagnuti zagovornik usvajanja bitcoina i drugih kriptovaluta, a dospoje na naslovne strane zbog značajnih olaganja svoje kompanije u bitcoin. U trenutku snimanja ovog videa, njegova kompanija posjeduje oko 130.000 bitcoina. Michael Saylor ima procenjeno neto bogatstvo veće od 1,5 milijarde dolara. Pogledajte ovaj video do kraja i saznajte kako je predviđanje Michaela Saylora za bitcoin Da li je pametno kupovati Bitcoin tokom inflacije? Šta regulativa može doneti u kriptosvet? Koji su drugi najbolji tokeni za kupovinu? I još mnogo toga. Ako vam se sviđaju informacije sa našeg kanala, lajkujte i subscribeujte se na kanal za još videa. So the Bitcoin price has gone through quite a roller coaster. What do you think is the high point is going to hit? I think it'll go forever, right? I mean... I think the Bitcoin is is going to it's going to climb in a serpentine fashion. It's going to advance and come back, and it's going to keep uh, it's going to keep climbing. I think that the volatility attracts all the capital into the marketplace, and so the volatility makes it the most interesting thing in the financial universe. It also generates massive yield and massive returns for traders, and that attracts capital. Like we're talking about the difference between 5% return and 500% return. Mm -hmm. So the fast money is attracted by the volatility. The volatility has been decreasing year by year by year. I think that um, that uh, it's stabilizing. I don't think we'll see as much volatility in the future as we have in the past. I think that um, if we look at Bitcoin and model it as uh, digital gold, so I would think it, you know, it goes from 10 trillion to 100 trillion as people start to think of it as digital property. What does that mean in terms of price uh, per, co per coin? At 500,000, right, that's a $10 trillion asset. At 5 million, that's a $100 trillion asset. So you think it crosses a million, it can go even higher? Yeah, I think it keeps going up forever. I mean, is there a reason we can go to 10 million a coin? Are there any alternative coins, any altcoins that you invest in or you're bullish on when you look at, I mean, I don't look at any of these that are out there right now. You're looking at Cardano or Ethereum. Are you just strictly? No, they're, into... all, they're all ventures, right? I mean, Bitcoin's the dominant crypto asset. Ethereum is the dominant crypto application. You can divide the entire universe into some segments, you know, and Ethereum is competing with Binance Smart Chain and Solana. That's very competitive. They're very complicated. They're very centralized, much more centralized than Bitcoin. They have to be centralized because they need to run on proof of stake networks because they need the speed. Mm -hmm. So proof of stake itself is orders of magnitude more centralized than proof of work because you don't have these sprawling networks of miners with their ASICs everywhere on earth sucking up energy to keep any one person from getting control of the network. So. Bitcoin is is like the dominant the dominant winner of sound money. These other things they're just very risky. They could crash, one could win, one could lose. So let me say it a different way. If you ha if you're a crypto investor and you run a venture capital fund and you want to make investments with high risk, high reward and you want to study it and you want to take the risk then you can trade in those things. But in my opinion, they're a hundred times less lucrative over time and they're a hundred times more risky. So it seems like it's a, you know, 10,000 to one difference. I wouldn't do it, but other people do it. And it's probably good for the industry because it markets the industry. Right. Right?
if you basically just bought them and turned off the television and right. didn't read a newspaper for a decade, you'd be better off. Yeah, because everything that you read is just calculated to give you anxiety and hysteria and, mm -hmm. and get you to trade or hedge your position. How does Bitcoin, how does cryptocurrency fit into this inflationary discussion right now? I think Bitcoin is the best monetary inflation hedge in the world. If you know that, um, that the central banks are going to expand the currency supply, then the uh, most important thing you can do is construct a portfolio of high quality assets that are scarce, uh, that are going to appreciate in price at a faster rate than the currency supply expands. And uh, so that means uh, Bitcoin, because it's ultimately scarce and fungible, you can transfer it anywhere in the world and people with money are always going to want it. Uh, and uh, after that, perhaps uh, clearly the home that you want to live in the rest of your life, trophy real estate that has tangible value to you, perhaps uh, trophy art, uh, a Mona Lisa, you know, something which is extremely scarce, you know, a Van Gogh painting. If the currency supply increases by a factor of 10 and you have a very scarce piece of art, presumably the price of the artwork is going to go up. Uh, the best thing going, of course, would be scarce assets that you can finance. So if you have a home that you love and you can get a two and a half percent mortgage for the next 10 to 30 years against it, then it makes sense to maximize the mortgage, hold the property. When the money supply is expanded by a factor of 10, if your home is in a place where no one else wants to live, it won't go up by a factor of 10 because it won't be scarce. But if you've got three acres in the Hamptons on the beach or in Palm Beach, right? If you, if you live in a, in a truly desirable community, the, the price of the home is going to go up. And as the price goes up, your loan's going to be fixed. You'll be able to refinance the home. You've got leveraged equity, if you will, or leveraged property. I think Bitcoin fits into that is Bitcoin is appreciating at the fastest rate, faster than the NASDAQ or the S&P or or luxury real estate or, 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 or average real estate around the country because it's the most scarce, most desirable asset. So that's how it fits in. Michael Saylor, you said before, there's no second best to Bitcoin. What would be the second best? Traditionally, there's Ethereum with smart contracts, Cardano with proof of stake, Polkadot with... Uh, uh, interoperability between blockchains. Dogecoin has the incredible power of the meme. Uh, privacy with Monero. I just can can keep going. There's. I think if you if you decompose or segment the crypto market, you've got crypto property. Bitcoin is the king of that. You know, and other Bitcoin forks that want to be an you know a bearer instrument store of value right? would be a property, a Bitcoin cash or Litecoin, something like that. Then you've got crypto currencies. I don't think I don't think Bitcoin's a currency because a, a, a currency I define in nation state sense. A currency is an, a digital asset that you can transfer as a you know in a transaction without incurring a taxable obligation. So that means it has to be a stable dollar or a stable euro or a stable yen, a stable coin. Mm -hmm. So I think you've got cryptocurrencies, Tether, Circle, most famous. Then I think you've got crypto platforms. You know, and Ethereum is the most famous of the crypto platforms, the platform upon which, you know, with smart contract functionality, et cetera. And then I think you've got just crypto securities. It's just like my favorite whatever meme coin, and I love it because I love it, and it's attached to my game or my company or my persona or my whatever. I think if you, if you, you know, pushed me and said, well, what's the second best? I would say... The world wants two things. It wants crypto property as a savings account and it wants cryptocurrency as a checking account. Mm -hmm. And that means that the that the most popular thing really is going to be a stable coin dollar. Right. And it's, there's a maybe a fight right now. It might be Tether. Right. But mm -hmm. st a, a stable dollar, because I feel like the market opportunity, it's not clear that there'll be one that will win. The class of stable dollars is probably a one to ten trillion dollar market easily. Mm -hmm. 
I think that in the crypto platform space, Ethereum will compete with Solana and Binance Smart Chain and, and the like. And Are there certain characteristics of any of them that kind of stand out to you? Do you don't you think the competition is based on a set of features? Also, so the set of features that a, that a cryptocurrency provides, but also the community that it provides. Don't you think the community matters and sort of the adoption, the dynamic of the adoption, both across the developers and the investors? If I'm looking at them, the, I mean, the first question is, is uh, what's the regulatory risk? How likely is it to be deemed a property versus security? And the second is, is what's the competitive risk? And the third is what's the speed and the performance? And, uh, and the, you know, all those things, you know, lead to the question of what's the security risk? How likely is it to crash and burn? And, and how stable or unstable is it? And then there's the, mar you know, the marketing risk. I mean, there are different teams behind each of these things and, and communities behind them. I, I think that um, the, the big cloud looming over the crypto industry is regulatory treatment of cryptocurrencies and regulatory treatment of crypto securities and crypto platforms. For example, um, there are people that would like only US, US FDIC insured banks to issue cryptocurrencies. They, they want JP Morgan to issue a crypto dollar backed one to one. But then in the US right now, we have Circle and we have other companies that are licensed entities that are backed by cash and cash equivalents, but they're not FDIC insured banks. Mm -hmm. There's also a debate in Congress about whether state chartered banks should be able to issue these things. And then we have Tether and, and others that are outside of the US jurisdiction. They're probably not backed by cash and cash equivalents. They're backed by stuff. And we don't know what stuff. And then finally, you have, you know, UST and DAI, which are algorithmic stable coins right, that are even uh, more innovative further outside the compliance framework. So if you ask who's going to win, the question is really, I don't know, will the market decide or will the regulators decide? If the regulators get out of the way and the market fought up, well, then it's an interesting discussion. Yeah. And then I think that all bets are off if, if the regulators get more heavy handed with this. And I think you could have the same discussion with crypto properties. Like, like the DeFi exchanges and the crypto exchanges, the SEC would like to regulate the crypto exchanges. They like to regulate the DeFi exchanges. That means they may regulate the crypto platforms and, and at what rate and in what fashion. And so I think that I could give you an opinion if, if it was limited to competition under the current regulatory regime. But uh, I think that the regulations are, are, are so fast moving and it's so uncertain that it's it, it it you can't make a decision without considering uh the potential actions of the regulators i hope the regulators get out of the way can you steal me on the case that dogecoin is uh i guess the second best cryptocurrency if you don't consider bitcoin a cryptocurrency but instead a crypto property I would classify it as crypto property because the US dollar is a currency. So unless yeah. your crypto asset is pegged algorithmically or stably to the value of the dollar is not a currency, it's a property or it's an asset. Some of these uh, central banks are pushing back on, on, on Bitcoin, on cryptocurrency. Are they scared? I really think that most central banks view it as an asset, a crypto asset. And so... I think there's a narrative in the community that central banks are pushing back on it. I really don't think they are. Mm -hmm. um, if I look at all the utterances, I think Mark Carney has said on the record, it's a crypto asset. Jerome Powell has said on the record, it's like digital gold, it's like an asset. Yeah, he sees it as a store of value. A store of value. The right. deputy governor of the Chinese central bank has said it's, it's an asset. Christina Lagarde uh, of the EU central bank has said, yeah, it's a it's an asset. I mean, they might say it's a speculative asset, but um, currency is a medium of exchange and it's the province of governments. And in order to be a currency, you have to be deemed non-taxable upon transfer. And Bitcoin is not. Bitcoin is uh, deemed property by the IRS and, and most countries deem it as property, which makes it an asset, not a currency. So 
I think that the way the world is evolving, we're going to see five billion or more people with mobile phones and mobile wallets. And in that wallet is going to be a selection of currencies and a selection of assets. And the strongest currency is the dollar. And the strongest asset is Bitcoin. And in countries like Venezuela, they're going to lose their currency privileges and uh, their citizens are going to default to the dollar as a medium of exchange. But the only way that you can deploy uh, dollars as a medium of exchange to billions of people across hundreds of countries and tens of thousands of banking systems or application networks is if you have a global settlement network, which is a shared monetary protocol, and that is Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is the global monetary network that allows everybody on Earth to store their economic energy over long periods of time. And it also allows everyone to synchronize those mobile wallets in Zimbabwe and Z Venezuela and Nigeria and India and Argentina and the US and China and the like. And so I see an emerging economy with a digital asset called Bitcoin and a digital currency, likely the dollar, but if not the dollar, perhaps uh, the renminbi, right? And if not, if not the Chinese currency, then perhaps the euro. At the end of the day, the winner is going to be the strongest currency, which will come from the strongest country and the strongest economic network, which will be the US. And the winning asset will be the strongest crypto asset with the greatest security and the greatest acceptance and the most stability, and that will be Bitcoin. So is it wrong then to be calling them cryptocurrencies? Yes, it is wrong. Um, most sophisticated people that have studied it realize they're crypto assets. Bitcoin is a crypto asset. Uh, it's not a cryptocurrency. It's a, it's a tragic misnomer. <laughs> and, uh, and because people call it a cryptocurrency, then it lends itself to a shallow criticism that it's not good as a currency because the central banks will ban it and because the tax treatment is poor and because the transaction rate is low. But again, those are all red herrings. It's not a currency, nor does it need to be a currency, right? Any, anybody thinking about it for even a few seconds realizes that if there's a taxable event every time I transfer it to you, it can't be a currency. So right. it's, it's, so, no, it's not a currency. It's an asset. And if you think of it as an asset, it's very helpful because then you realize it's not competing with the dollar and the euro. It's competing with gold and silver. Hmm. It's competing with bearer instruments. Uh, and, and to a certain degree, it's competing with bonds as a store of value. And it's competing with ETFs like the S&P 500 index as a store of value. And once you understand it that way, then you're not so afraid anymore because you understand the regulatory framework that comes to Bitcoin is the same regulatory framework that comes to gold, silver and S&P 500 indexes. It's just know your customer, anti-money laundering regulations. And if you're if you're afraid to buy Bitcoin because you're afraid of regulation, you shouldn't be. Because if it is regulated parapasu or at, at parity with these other assets, it will create um, it'll create an avalanche of institutional money flow into the asset class because it'll simply normalize the treatment in the Western world. The IRS in 2014 deemed it to be property. Right. And but as I mean, property, they... it means that it means that when you transfer it, you owe a capital gains tax. So there is like zero chance the IRS is going to reverse that. It is property. It's not a currency. I totally agree with you. And I think if we can get this message out to more people, people that are scared about, you know, th this thing that's unfamiliar, you know, you fear what you don't know. And so I think that's what a lot of people are right now. They think that the, it's it's safe. It's cushy to sit there in their 401k um, to continue to, you know, trade time for money and, you know, and and watch their U.S. dollar continue to be debased. When you have last year, was it 25% of all U.S. currency was created and printed last year? You got to study and you got to learn something new. And the people that are their fastest learners, they're going to jump on top of this the soonest. 
and the people that are the slowest learners, you know, uh, rich, uh, rich elites, they're not going to bother to learn because they're, they get a lot of money. And if they own the S and P 500 index, they made a lot of money last year doing nothing. So they feel smart and safe and Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. They're not going to learn because in your nineties, when you've got more money than God, there's no catalytic event that'll force you out of your comfort zone. Right. People in Venezuela get forced out of their comfort zone, right? You've right. got to be jarred out of your comfort zone. And then you got to spend anywhere from 10 hours to a hundred hours. And then you'll start to find a new set of tools. And there are some tools that are better than others. I obviously think the Bitcoin is the best tool. If you can't do that, find something truly scarce that uh, you value. How do you see, what is the exit strategy then for, for Bitcoin, for you? Um, with there your is whole... no exit strategy. See, the point is, why, like, why would you exit from the best investment asset in the world if it keeps getting better? Like, there's nothing you can buy that's better. So you're, you're selling the winner to buy the loser. If, um, let, let, me, let me make it uh, simpler. If you owned, um, if you owned uh, a company in Venezuela, and the company sold anything and you got paid in bolivars mm -hmm. and you decided that, and, and you knew that the bolivar is going to keep falling at like 20 30 percent a year and you roll the clock back 20 years if you were if you were uh, unwise you just keep working and eventually your assets go to zero and if you were smart you would convert your cash flows into us dollars and put it in a bank in new york city now when would you exit from the from the dollars in New York City and trade back into the bolivars in Venezuela? <laughs> right. When? Unless if that became a standard, if that became the leading currency in the world. Well, what if the United States government said, well, you know, you can do it tax free. You're still not going to do it. No, right. Exactly. Right. I mean, and that would be the case for any any uh, weakening currency in Argentina and if you're in Zimbabwe, when are you going to exit your U.S.? If you basically bought, you know, a New York City apartment and companies in New York City and you're a billionaire in the United States, when are you going to sell all that and reinvest it back in Zimbabwe? Point is, one of the assets is stronger than the other asset. If Bitcoin is capped at 21 million for the next thousand years, it's only going to get more valuable. You know, you could say it's like buying a block of Manhattan 200 years ago, but it's better than that. Because if you bought if you bought land in Manhattan 200 years ago, when would you sell it? To buy land in Kansas? To buy, why would you ever, <laughs> right? You wouldn't ever sell it. But this is better than that because this is one city in cyberspace where 5 billion people are going to live there. You don't need the second city or the third. Right. Like, like, whereas in, you can make the argument that, well, you need a Tokyo and a London and a Paris. But in cyberspace, people in Tokyo, London and Paris and Manhattan are all putting their money in Bitcoin. So so this is a, it's a global dominant, pure monetary energy network. So there's you don't need an exit strategy. Is there advice here for young people in high school and college how to um, have a career they can be proud of, how to have a life they can be proud of? My advice if you're entering adulthood, focus your energy, guard your time, train your mind, train your body, think for yourself, curate your friends, curate your environment, keep your promises, stay cheerful and constructive and upgrade the world.